Hello and welcome to the ninth webinar of the Engineering Rising to the Challenge Initiative from Purdue Engineering. My name is Arvind Raman and the Executive Associate Dean in the college. Uh, now this initiative started in May 2020, uh, partly in response to the National Academy of Engineering's call to action uh, for engineers to tackle some of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but our initiative also looks to the longer term future uh, to rethink and re-engineer the very systems that our modern society has come to depend on um, so that they might be more resilient to such shocks in the future while also serving society better. Now, part of the initiative involves webinars where distinguished panelists unpack some of these challenges and provide us a glimpse into what the future might look like. Uh, today's panel is about resilient innovation for social equity. And it is my honor to introduce uh, the moderator for today's discussion, uh, Dr. A.J. Malshe. Dr. A.J. P. Malshe, uh, the R. Eugene and Susie E. Goodson Distinguished Professor of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. Um, uh, and he, he previously held a uh, Distinguished Professor position uh, at the University of Arkansas, Arkansas uh, before moving here uh, recently. His areas of expertise are advanced manufacturing, bio-inspired designing, multifunctional material surface engineering, and system integration and productization. Since 2018, he has begun to apply his manufacturing design, materials and systems engineering expertise to examine the national challenges of nutritious food and other forms of techno-socioeconomic insecurities through accessibility, affordability, and sustainability. Um, in his experience, he has published more than 200 peer-reviewed publications and more than 20 patents, which have resulted in engineered products utilized in the energy, aerospace, food manufacturing, heavy-duty transportation, uh, EV, and high-performance racing. Uh, his innovations have received the R&D 100 Award, multiple Edison Awards, the Tibet Awards, amongst many others. Uh, in 2018, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering uh, for uh, his innovations in nano manufacturing with impact in multiple industry sectors. Now, in addition to his research and translational activities, uh, Dr. Malshe has educated 60 PhD and postdoctoral uh, scholars and demonstrated commitment to undergraduate and K through 12 education. Uh, without further ado, uh, over to you, AJ. Well, thank you very much, Arvind, for a generous introduction. And I would like to welcome all the attendees. So in my introduction to the panelists, I'll be doing an introduction to this little bit about the subject and the backdrop. But at this point in time, without any further delay, I would like to welcome you all to the panel as Professor Raman said. This is the initiative ER2C where COVID related. It is almost like an earthquake, it is a health quake and the society has experienced the challenges across the board. With that, the RISE initiative that is launched from Purdue, what we look for is that are we doing the right innovation that can help America and the world across the board? So with an important discovery during this time that more and more we realize that it is the inequity and inequity gaps, this is not a socioeconomic challenge, but it is a techno socioeconomic challenge. As all engineers and industries are poised and excited about Industry 4.0 and going beyond, at the same time, in the same place, in the same communities across America, what we also see is this gap, that when everything is going super on the top, people are suffering at the bottom with average capita income of 36,000. Now that poses the question that what technology is helping the society? And that's where really the curiosity and this passion started with the attitude of servant leadership. If you look at the Maslow pyramid, the number of innovations, those are happening are at the tip where self-actuation is important, but the way most of the needs are, they are at the very bottom. And this is something, a question that one can ask, oh, what is, where are we going? Because during this process, the best technology that came and the innovations, I like to harbor on the word innovation that came to the rescue of the most is a mask. And that very mask was also used 100 years before. So what is resilience? This word is used like intelligence, smartness, numerous times. It is an intrinsic property of a system to resist and recover and adapt 
to a new and improved state in time and further definition is right across from you but this is a very complex way to say the simple thing bottom line if you can come across any small large challenges and all society survives and excels through that and how we build a resilience is very important so in that it really peeling off as i said the layers of these complexities the numbers here today as i was mentioning here that the mask was to the rescue and 100 years before some of you may not know in spanish flu this was the solution to america and the world as well so what we improve what we advance what the technology means what we do to the human kind and with that typically society is our reflections and are we innovating and investing in what matters and with that question how can we think outside the box so today's webinar my colleagues would discuss how we think outside the box and we are do are we asking the right questions because the questions right questions lead to potentially right answers so the example of resilience is that flower which is growing in the middle of a desert and that's where the equity equality balance and harmony they coincide together so the examples of what we call frugal innovations not cheap frugal how they perform and how they are accessible this is an example from purdue this is back called pex this is helping across multiple parts of the world there is a three layer engineered structure very accessible across the start of the society this is for agriculture second example for water basic human need at the back, bottom of the maslow pyramid in peru where the harvesting the fog in the air is helping community providing light to the communities in philippines and brazil and parts of the world where the simple solution for recycling the plastic and this is in the middle ranges of himalaya for water so these are some of the most simple important science ideas those that are applied for innovation to help the communities and bring people out of poverty and provided opportunity for upward mobility so because we see that going forward readiness of the society trustworthiness on people and technology and inequity would be some of the most important challenges we will be facing so we do more further delay as we think outside the box let me introduce my panelist as you will find out who brings the expertise across all these areas technology innovation equity equality data science and healthcare our first panelist would be dr joseph seinfeld his team of contribution would be dynamics of innovations and lessons learned His brief bio is Professor Sinfield is a professor of civil engineering at Purdue University and the founding director of Purdue University's College of Engineering and Innovation and Leadership Studies program. His work focuses on innovation science, systems and sensors and he has 20 years of experience as an advisor to senior leaders of multinational corporations on the methods of identifying, prioritize and commercialize growth opportunity. design new business model and manage study challenges is one of the most prolific colleagues we have on the campuses and he would be contributing to the dynamics of innovation colleague who is also expert in design area mechanical engineering with the distinctions in many dr tahir reed smith he is an associate professor in the school of mechanical engineering at purdue university and is the director of the research in engineering and interdisciplinary design laboratory and is a visiting nasa scholar her research interest includes qualifying and integrating human centered considerations in the design process and human machine systems her research programs receive multiple funding opportunities from the prestige agencies like national science foundation air force sr procter and gamble ford corporation and general motors the third colleague who brings the industry and community centric perspective is Dr. Carl Schnell. He comes from Corteva Industries. Example he would be sharing would be data driven innovations for food equity in urban desert in Indianapolis. His brief bio is Dr. Carl Schnell is a global operational excellence leader at Corteva AgriScience. In his current role he identifies and develops cross functional R&D initiatives for strategy contributions improvement and productivity processes. Carl is also delighted to provide his time and talent in project and leadership and data analytics for the Indy Hunger Network all aligned for food in 
food security. As a result of his team's pro bono work, New Food Pantry, WIC clinics, and congregate meal sites have been opt optimally placed in the local communities. And last but not the least, my colleague, Dr. Yuvern He, her contribution would be in the team example of data-driven innovations for healthy eating in urban and rural deserts and policies that go with this. Dr. Yi is a professor of industrial engineering and currently serves as the academic director of Laser Pulse, a consortium at Purdue University that is directed by Professor Raman, and it is one of the most prestigious and important projects for the country. Her core research is system modeling and decision making for complex system operation design, monitoring, evaluation, and risk mitigation. Applications of her research include manufacturing, supply chain, and humanitarian aid, healthcare, as well as sectors in global development. So all these spherical angles that we bring to the topic of resilient innovations for social equity. With that, I would like to invite our first panelist, Dr. Jocentra. Thank you. Thank you so much, AJ. I will try to share my screen here and provide some brief remarks to seed our conversation today about resilient innovation. With the overall perspective that I'm sharing being driven by a topic we call innovation science, and we're really going to be looking at how we apply innovation science to grand challenges and see what perspectives that sparks about the overall issue of resilient innovation. Uh, innovation science, for those of you who haven't perhaps seen the term before, is really an integration of disciplines. It is the definition of convergence in many ways. And we're bringing together the visionary perspectives and landscape perspectives that are part of strategy with the intent that comes from design. So we can ultimately create solutions that are optimized to the landscape that we might encounter. We then combine that with patterns of innovation success. And these patterns are reinforced through massive data science, where we can really see very high numbers of cases that suggest that a particular type of innovation format might work best in certain conditions. And at that intersection of all of these fields gives us this perspective that we can move innovation from really a domain that historically might have been characterized by serendipity or luck to a domain that's much closer to rules that we can apply to have an enhanced chance of getting the outcomes that we seek. When we begin to use big data to uncover patterns of innovation, we start to see cause effect relationships between different forms of innovation and the context in which they work. And many of you have probably seen a variety of terms that are used as modifiers for the word innovation, be that terms like disruptive innovation or modular or architectural innovation. And very importantly, all of these terms are actually very distinct and they work only in specific circumstances. And so one of the efforts that we pursue in innovation science is trying to understand what characterizes these different forms of innovation. And this is a very small sample of what really are dozens of variants of innovation. And what are the characteristics of the environments in which they can be applied successfully? And that way, when we encounter a problem, such as a resilient innovation challenge, we can do our best to try to match the solution design to the needs of that particular context. And looking at a wide range of complex socio-technical challenges over the last seven or eight years now, we've uncovered a variety of patterns that reinforce our understanding of these situations. We've examined problems as broad as looking at potable water availability in uh, rural areas of different countries around the world, examination of food security at the level of a nation, the delivery of drugs and medications to address different disease conditions, and other situations such as poverty in urban metro areas and the challenges that come with smart cities. And very interestingly, one of the most exciting perspectives that I think has been yielded through this examination is that while these problems are all different, in many ways, they are all quite the same. And that is one of the things that can help perhaps help us drive toward a space of solutions. And in fact, they share a variety of success factors regardless of the problem type. Those success factors tend to fall into the 16 areas that are highlighted in the circular graphic on the left-hand side of the slide, and they really fall in four major groups. One is inevitably there are characteristics of the population in terms of driving adoption, the motivation and awareness of the challenge, and having the resources they need to try to address the problem that are at hand that are critical in any situation. In addition, if we are going to provide some form of solution, be it a product, a service, a policy, what have you, we need the infrastructure in place and the related supply chain of 
resources or talents that might make that possible. And all this has to exist in an environment where we understand the organizational structure, the hierarchy of decision-making, and the policies and leadership uh, structures that are in place that make it possible to deliver a solution. These three sets of variables are really part of somewhat of a static picture of the environment, but we have to combine that with a dynamic understanding. And this goes to Professor Melshi's point about resilience. We need to create a system that is resilient and sustainable over time. When we examine these factors, we've also found that a construct that we call poets is quite useful in getting multiple perspectives on the problem. We can draw an insight into the situation and its effect on physiology, on the psychology of the stakeholders that might be involved, and ultimately the linkages to the political climate. We also can bring in views on the operations that might be required to carry out the delivery of a solution and its impact on economics, the environment, and education in that area. Ultimately, we might have some technical developments that are required, as well as sociological implications on the cultural environment. And all of these things have to be looked at, ultimately, at multiple levels. And we try to think about varying levels of abstraction when looking at these problems and extend from examination of the individual and their role in their households, their role in their community, but then also how institutions at a regional and national level play a part in ultimately addressing these challenges. And for any one of the given complex socio-technical problems that we've had a chance to work on in collaboration with either corporations, nonprofit agencies, and even governments in some cases, we found that regardless of the problem, we have somewhere between 800 and 1,000 things that have to be true in order for a solution to really work. And quite often when we come at a problem from any one discipline, we're addressing only a small subset of that system. Sometimes we're fortunate and many aspects of that system are already in place and working. We're able to close the final gap. But oftentimes we seem to be working on what might feel like a moving target as you talk to practitioners in the field when they're working on a particular problem because there are so many moving pieces. And a lot of the work in innovation science is intended to help us get our arms around what those pieces are so that we can begin to dedicate resources effectively. Ultimately, one of the more interesting pieces of the pattern that we found is that those populations that might be achieving a, a disenfranchised outcome or receiving an unequitable share of the resources that are in an environment are often blocked from equity by a variety of variables. And those variables might pertain to skill or knowledge that they may or may not have about a situation, their ability to have the wealth that's required to access solutions that are available, simply physical access, that resources may not be available where they need them and when they need them. There are time constraints, that is, other parts of people's lives get in the way of pursuing certain kinds of solutions. And then there's a host of other things that are related to behavior, attitude, and belief systems that can have an influence on driving a disenfranchisement of different populations. And interestingly, these same seven factors seem to be, again, apparent regardless of the particular challenge that we're facing. And by being aware of them before we begin to solve the problem, we have a chance to try to proactively design to overcome any of these obstacles. And very importantly, in our work that has spanned work around the world in low to middle income countries, all the way back to work in the United States and other parts of the uh, higher income portions of the world, we've seen that the same barriers apply and thus they're very relevant both beyond and within our borders. Ultimately, all these factors contribute to a certain form of innovation, returning back to this notion of patterns, and that form is what we call enabling innovation. And enabling innovation is a form of innovation that drives high impact. And it has the ability to reach many, many people and drive an impact cascade over time. But importantly, it is a combination of factors that yield enabling innovation that have to evolve through both technical and conceptual breakthroughs over time to aggregate into a holistic capability. And those factors might be related to technology, but they could also be related to economics, to changes in habits, to changes in social awareness on a problem, and even elements of policy that might be part of the situation, all of which are really contributing to the creation of a much more capable innovation that can drive a system level change in the environment. And so these are just the short remarks I wanted to use to start off our discussion today. And I'll, I'll leave it there to see if there's any related questions or if we wanna continue our dialogue. Cool. Thank you, Jeff. At this point in time, uh, I think we will wait for questions. So we will come back to the questions and also at the later end. So please, everybody, post your questions. So thank you, Jogim. Uh, we will go to Dr. Reed Smail. Tahir, please go ahead. Thank you. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming to this event. And so some of my remarks will be centered around this idea of engaging the minds of engineers and social issues of our day, especially engineering students. And I thought I would open this up by just sharing a little bit about my educational journey and how I started out thinking, um, being trained in sort of traditional mechanical engineering, and then at the PhD level, um, switching over to start thinking about people more, um, bringing in psychology into my research um, in the design science program, um, and then continuing on in a postdoc. Um, it's mechanical engineering, but still interdisciplinary. I was around people doing virtual reality, human computer, computer interaction, all of that. And then I established a research lab here where I had the space and the room to start to continue thinking along those lines, um, bringing in the human-centered aspects to my research. And then um, last year I was on sabbatical all year. Um, and a portion of that time was um, at NASA, um, largely in the fall, and I'm still engaged with them until now. And, and that also, um, the focus there was thinking largely about users, stakeholders, and beneficiaries um, with um, opportunity identification and using design process methods. Um, there's this paper I love to reference. It comes from several researchers in engineering education, and it talks about the people part of engineering. Um, and engineering, you know, when you, when you step into a problem, you're engineering with others in a team, you're engineering as a person, you bring your whole self to that. And you're engineering, you're doing engineering work for people. Um, and, and it spans communities, the world, um, et cetera. But what we need to do is we need to create spaces where we can welcome students to bring their entire selves to problems. And there are quite a bit of uh, social issues happening that um, appeal to the minds of students. And just really at a high level, my research lab, just to kind of give you a point of view of the types of things that I've been doing um, and the, the topic areas. I love acronyms. As you can see, everything has an acronym, um, you know, socially and culturally relevant engineering design, um, design thinking and problem solving, et cetera. So broadly speaking, this is what my lab does. Um, we think about people in different ways, um, either the designer, him or herself, designer or engineer, him or herself um, or themselves. Um, or the end users are those that might experience what we create. So last year I was on sabbatical all year um, and there were lots of things happening, right? We, we all experienced COVID together. We, you know, the shutdowns were happening. Um, then, you know, around July, um, this, the big thing that happened with George Floyd, that was a major, major motivator for me. It was in July, around June or July, actually it happened in May, but there was so much, the protests, you guys might remember global protests were happening and my annual conference in design engineering was happening in August. And I was in discussions with some of my colleagues in ME about like, how can design engineer, how can we get involved and do something in this space? I, I was just in this, this mindset of, I don't want to just talk about research. I don't want to just get together and talk with folks just to talk with them. Um, how do we bring what we know and what we do into this space? And it was just sort of like, sort of this burning, um, just unsettled kind of a space um, that was happening. And we talked about ways we could try to do it and um, didn't quite pan out um, immediately. And then I started um, sabbatical time, the rest of my sabbatical time at NASA where there was lots of, um, and it was all telework, by the way, um, lots of interactions all around design, design process methods, how do we um, really think deeply about the um, people and in, in, uh, what we're doing, et cetera. And then this picture on the upper right um, is called DigiDog. It's created by Boston Dynamics. Um, this is an, uh, one of my newer motivators created by Boston Dynamics um, on their website, it's called Spot. Um, but what you see is a photograph of this DigiDog deployed in New York City. Um, the NYPD was using this DigiDog in Queens, Brooklyn, um, and the Bronx. Um, just testing it out, um, $75,000 investment, testing it out to see, well, can it help, how can it help us? And certainly 
um, it, it is performing a great task, like you know, searching buildings and kind of going into spaces where maybe a human going into that space would be more risky. It's better to send a robot. But the flip side of that is have the, the communities were not prepared um, for the presence of this DigiDog. Um, people don't even know what an autonomous system is. Um, they walk out and it's like, what is this? No permission, no sort of um, awareness or warning about that. And, and largely these are marginalized communities um, in New York City. And so there's questions around deployment. And some of my work um, involves looking at human machine interactions, autonomous systems, um, et cetera. But some of the questions that we need to be thinking about is, okay, once we have our algorithms all figured out, and you know, that's a whole separate discussion on some of um, biases that can get embedded in those. But once we get them figured out and we start deploying these in communities, who is helping someone's grandma who's used to going down to the bodega at the corner to understand what this is when it's walking around. Um, think about when driverless vehicles, um, let's say Lyft gets to their goal of being able to send a driverless car um, into a certain community or neighborhoods and a driverless vehicle shows up to your grandma's house or to your aunt's house and they she she's never seen one. And how who's preparing them to embrace these new technologies. I don't see much discussion about that um, as well. And so between the social considerations, between my time at NASA, um, and uh, I was thinking of a graduate level class to teach. And so this spring, I launched this class, a new one called Design Sprints for Complex Engineering Problems and Socio-Technical Systems. And the motivation was to create this space where we can gather graduate students in engineering, the College of Engineering, to start thinking about these things, to start getting, to give permission for students to not just think about the technical aspects, but to really think about how can the engineering influence the social aspects of this. And um, we have several different projects going on. Actually, one um, in particular is motivated by some work that engineers are doing um, in parallel at NASA regarding urban air mobility. Um, our students are working largely in public health and emergency management. And then there's some others um, that have taken on, there's uh, one per person in particular taken on the task of thinking about how might an engineer bring uh, some insights to law enforcement? How do we make it a win-win? How do we make it a safe situation for police officers and for suspects? We want everyone to go home and there's some decision-making errors happening. How can we get in that space? Um, some others doing things with uh, redefining sports and what, it, what does it mean to be safe and what does it mean to have good performance? Several on food security topics. And then you have others that are working on um, projects that it may not be directly obvious um, who the humans are, um, but they're being challenged to think about who they, who they are and how to bring it into their project. Um, and just briefly, just to get some high level feedback that I've gotten from the mid-semester evaluation, um, students commented on the open-mindedness of the lectures and um, their thoughts being acknowledged, the interactivity of the class, um, engaging despite being online. Um, and the two in the bottom that's bolded, I just I put those there just to kind of capture a full quote that students um, had talking about the eye-opening experiences and the unique opportunities um, to think about the impacts of, um, on society that they would never have thought of. Um, and then the bringing in of qualitative methods. Some, some students have never thought about the use of qualitative methods or had an opportunity to think, how can you bring that into engineering problem solving? And so just to, to conclude my comments here, um, I really think it's very critical that we find ways, we normalize engaging engineers on social issues, present day, not the, the typical things on sustainability. Those are all important. We still need to think about that. But some of the, the very human, um, some of it might be political, some of it might be messy, some of it might be uncomfortable, but we, we can't stay comfortable. Um, we need to be more intentional. Um, it, it will be inconvenient. If it's too inconvenient to think about some things, bring some experts in from outside of the, your field. 
Um, but I think we're in a, an hour where the students are students are wanting to see how can I really make a difference with what I'm doing um, and learning. So with that, I will um, pause and allow AJ to transition us. Well, thank you very much, Tahira. Uh, very, uh, some of the very great points that you built upon what Case Joe was making before. So with that, we will go to our next distinguished panelist, Dr. Carl Chanel. Carl, uh, please go ahead. Uh, yes, I'll uh, probably just introduce myself first since I think I'm more of an outlier here than anyone else. I'll share my screen and uh, show you a PowerPoint that I've made. And so really I've started out in my career in process engineering. And if you can see that hopefully I started my career in, in a lot of different chemical companies, Monsanto, DuPont, went back to school in artificial intelligence and engineering a long time ago, and then ended up at Dow Elenco, Dow Agri Sciences, and then finally Corteva, where we are now. And that's my progression over time for work history. Uh, for my background academically, I went to Vanderbilt and Northwestern in chemical engineering both. And I've really developed a, a passion, I think, for data analytics, for using data to make decisions and both in process engineering as well as in R&D. So now I'm in R&D for Corteva, which is uh, centered down in Indianapolis, just an hour or two away from Purdue's campus. And I really started to use some tools like JUMP for statistical analysis, for designing experiments, for helping scientists and engineers to make better decisions with their data, as well as continuous improvement and Lean and Six Sigma and many different process improvement and operational excellence tools to really help R&D. So that's just a little bit about my background. And what I want to talk today really was driving innovation for food security. And that's really where I've, I've started to do a lot of pro bono work, you could say, outside of my uh, regular job. So food insecurity is really defined as lack of consistent access to food for all household members, resulting in limited or uncertain availability of adequate food. So there's many different forms that takes. It's not just the homeless that have no access to food on a daily basis. It could be seniors at the end of the month when they run out of their uh, checks and that don't have enough money for the last few days. It could be in the winter time when people are spending all their income on housing and heat they don't have enough food. It could be people that are perhaps five out of seven uh, days they can eat. The other two days, they really don't know where their meals are coming from. So it's, it's, a, it's a large uh, issue and it's uh, varied too. Lots of uncertainty and variability. So right now in Indianapolis though, I think we've done some innovative things and it's really because of these players I've listed here, the Indy Hunger Network, the IHN has been a big uh, help in this area over the last five or 10 years. The local government, uh, NGOs and private corporations as well. You can see a couple news items here that uh, the mayor of Indianapolis really has decided to try to sustain the efforts he started. He's not gonna be the mayor forever. So he's made a division of community nutrition and food to try to sustain the efforts that the city is doing. Uh, there's also corporations like Elenco that's headquartered here in Indianapolis that really is supporting the food security effort. But I wanna um, talk a little bit about just the Indy Hunger Network and their effect and what they've done. Because really, if you look at the numbers, 10% of the US population is food insecure by that definition above, which means what, one in six households in Indianapolis, that's, that's, that's huge, huge numbers. And that's one reason I got involved with it. So I'm really talking about a, uh, probably a, a household or community type of level, referring back to Professor Seinfeld's framework. So it's really something that's um, passionate for me to try to help and really uh, see if I can apply some of my skill sets as a chemical engineer and as a systems uh, designer type of person and background to help in this area. So if you look at uh, a little bit more of the detail about food and where food comes from for those people that are food insecure, it's very interesting to really understand that if you look at this pie chart, SNAP, 
supplies half of the food. That's a USDA national program, along with school summer meals and WIC. So 75% of the food for food insecure people in the US really come from US government programs. So local community efforts really need to fill in only that other 25%. And that's what it looks like in Marion County, at least uh, last year. So I'm saying only 25%, but there's still a huge gap. And there's also something that's really uh, inequitable about that gap as well. If you look at some of these percentages, that have just been gathered by the Indie Hunger Network this year, looking at equity across different cohorts of the population in Marion County. So living down in Indianapolis, really Marion County and Indianapolis are the same thing. The government uh, is the same. And we also look at the surrounding counties as well for some of these issues. So the donut counties, as we call them, but Marion County and Indianapolis, as I said, are only an hour or two away from Purdue and being the, the capital of Indiana and with a large population, then that's why we're looking at food security in Marion County right now. And going back to that equity issue, if you look at that 10% national average, really it's much worse when you look at, for instance, Hispanic households at 16%, uh, black households at 19%, 28% uh, of households with children headed by a single woman are food insecure. So there's huge issues and huge inequalities that we need to start thinking about and what kind of innovation can we use to help solve these issues. So just to give you some more graphics uh, on the left, uh, just recently because of COVID, uh, if you look at the, the meal gap is actually decreasing in Indianapolis before COVID. So we were down to 38, three, th 380,000 meals a month gap. So that's huge, but that was decreasing until COVID and from recent Indie Hunger Network surveys that have been done post uh, COVID, we are doing COVID, it seems like it's almost doubled now because of COVID. So it's not getting better, it's getting worse. And so after COVID, can we bring that number back down? And once we do that, can we bring it down even lower than the pre-COVID number? That's our goal. And one way that systems analysis can work is really looking at the food system, which is on the right here, so going from the top right of donors to the bottom left of the hungry, this is basically all the uh, organizations that deal with food insecurity in Marion County and the Donut Counties. And a lot of those boxes are really partners in the Indie Hunger Network. So just to show you some of the things we've done with data and decision making for the Indie Hunger Network, it's really um, this IHN is really a partnership and it's really started a while ago. And I think that's one of the innovations that have helped Indianapolis figure out how to solve that meal gap compared to many other cities in the US. So I'm very proud to uh, work for Corteva who gives me the time to do this. And some of their sustainability goals are community outreach and food security, as well as being in a community that has the Indy Hunger Network. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes here in some of these examples. But just going back through time, what we've recently looked at and helped them with is looking at trying to apply quantitative methods. I think it's sort of opposite, exactly opposite of what Professor uh, Reed Smith just said about can we apply qualitative thinking instead of quantitative thinking. I'm almost going the opposite direction in these uh, micro situations. The NGOs, Indie Hunger Network, the partners that work in food security are not um, very analytical. So I think the systems approach and data analytics approach really helps them. And they have the data, but it's not organized. So it's really the old 80-20 rule, right? 80% of the time is just figuring out what the question is they wanna ask, uh, where the data is, can we organize the data, acquire it, clean it up, and then do the math modeling or analysis. So this first one on the left is really very simple. There was one of the partners, a very large uh, food pantry north of Indianapolis uh, decided to deliver meals during COVID instead of people coming to the food pantry. And so they were delivering meals to all these locations and they had no idea where they were. They had addresses and they said, well, you know, they must be all just centered around uh, the church where the food pantry is, which is the red star. And obviously just plotting this out, we could say, no, a lot of them are coming from the north side of Indianapolis. And if you look, there are people in 
uh, Noblesville, Franklin, Lebanon, way outside of Indianapolis as well, driving all the way in or you're driving out there to deliver food. So that really, get, I open their eyes. And it's a very simple thing to do. Once you get that data showing these maps, the GIS, geographical information systems that we have really helps them understand their data and helps them uh, answer questions. The one in the middle is interesting too. This was a really uh, partnership between Indigo, the local bus line and the Indy Hunger Network. One of the issues with uh, Indigo was that they, with cost cutting, they had to get rid of some bus stops. So immediately the Indy Hunger Network said, well, are you getting rid of bus stops that are near any of our pantries? And in Marion County, there are probably 150 or more food pantries spread out all over the county which are the red and the green dots on this map in the middle. Um, so what we did was we did some uh, GIS work and overlaid several layers. We overlaid the bus stops in the little blue dots with those locations and then did some analysis to see where are the pantries that are more than half a mile away and those are in red. So you notice that if you look at all of the red dots they are not near any of the uh, bus lines. So taking away those bus stops did not affect the uh, access for people that have to take the bus. So one of the big issues with food insecurity and getting access to food is where are, uh, where are the people in need and where are the food pantries and other sources of food and what is the transportation available to get there. On the far right, um, we thought in general that urban deserts would be correlated to where there are people in need and where there is food insecurity must be in the urban deserts. The urban deserts for food really is something that's been defined by the USDA as low income and low access areas. And so this is the county again on the right and those green shaded areas are census tracts. Those census tracts are smaller than the uh, zip codes. So at least you can get data down to, from the US census down to the census tract which is a much smaller area to zero in on. So there's no personal data involved, but we can at least get down to that track. And so if you do some overlays in a GIS system again and map it out and show the India Hunger Network, we really showed that where uh, Gleaner's Food Bank was delivering food during COVID was not directly correlated to the food deserts. So you can see in the middle of Indianapolis is a hot spot but that's not officially a food desert, just north of there is. And if you look on the outskirts, there's food deserts all around the outskirts of Marion County as well. And there's also needs out there as well, but there's not a direct correlation. There's lots of need outside of food deserts uh, during COVID. And so that's another interesting uh, aspect that we learned from doing some modeling. And just to wrap up, uh, this is where we really started with the IHN when they formed they, uh, the one reason they formed in Indianapolis is because there were so many uh, NGOs trying to help uh, fill that uh, gap in food. And so for the food insecure, there are enough, there's so much need that everyone was doing their own thing, getting as much resources as they could and delivering it to as many people as they could. And they didn't really care what everyone else did in the, in the community because there's such a great need. But eventually they realized, well, we need to solve the meal gap. If we get down to zero, how do we do that? We have to collaborate. We have to have a partnerships. And so that's when the Indian Hunger Network formed. And that's, I think, the innovation really in Indianapolis is we have that network of food insecurity, of food security people working in the area. So on the left here, we plotted out census tracts with people in poverty below the poverty level and looked at some of the largest food pantries. And those are in the green circles here. And they're, I think, with a, a mile radius around them. So you can see there's a, they're not really in the places with people in poverty. And the other thing you notice downtown, we had three large food pantries, but people in poverty are spread out all over Indianapolis. It's not just downtown. They're way out here around the edges as well. And so what we did was some sophisticated supply chain modeling. We looked at um, looking at like a cog and spoke model is what I call it, but a supply demand model where we could match people in poverty by census tract to where are the food pantries. And so this middle star diagram is really an optimal placement 
So they were thinking we had what six large pantries. If we had three new large pantries for a total of nine, what would be the optimal placement of those pantries in Marion County to hit uh, those um, census tracts that had the highest poverty levels? And the optimization would be then to reduce the travel time or the, just the distance between those census tracts and that where we would place those pantries. Of course, this is optimal and you can't go to a corner in Indianapolis and tear down a building and put up a food pantry. And so we take this and we looked at what was reality, which was over here. And there were some very, very large pantries in the middle. The largest pantry in Indiana is probably St. Vincent de Paul right down, downtown. So what you noticed was there's nothing on the far south. There's nothing in the um, northwest as well up here. There's nothing up here, nothing down here. And it turns out there was a church in a hospital in Corteva up here that said, hey, maybe we can solve this issue. Let's put a large food pantry right here. And so because of this modeling, we actually put a large food pantry here a few years ago. So that was a big win because of the data analytics and the mapping and the supply chain modeling. And the other thing just to point out on the right uh, while I'm wrapping up here is that we also looked at just those different people supplying uh, food to those in need in Marion County and where the overlapping gaps were. And one of the interesting things that really motivated the uh, different groups in the Indian Hunger Network to get together and communicate and have uh, meetings and really coordinate how they deliver food was this map. Because if you looked at meals delivered to seniors in poverty, then uh, there's several there's several organizations, Second Helpings, Meals on Wheels, Sokoa were the big three. And when you zoom into downtown, we noticed that all three of those uh, suppliers were actually on the same corner in Indianapolis, so they never knew that until they saw this map and started talking because of the Indian Hunger Network. And so maybe one of the things they should think about is, well, do we really need to have three different facilities or places where we serve seniors lunch at the same corner? So let's see if we can, how do we cover Indianapolis better and get rid of some of those overlaps? So those are some of the ways that we can help with uh, decision-making using data. And it really turned out that all the data that we've had so far is we can give them bar charts and analysis, but the way to really show the people involved and to motivate them that yes, to make decisions is to use these kinds of maps. And so we've really started to, to try to figure out how can we show maps and make decisions with data and then display it with these kinds of maps to make it very obvious for the people involved. So some of the things we've learned over time are really connectedness. We're all connected and we need to be more inclusive, I think. The meal gap might be solved, but it, it could come back again. I'm just thinking we were really doing really good before COVID in Marion County and we're not doing well now. So can we go back to where we were pre-COVID? And once we get there, can we solve the gap even further? Um, partnerships are key as we saw in this Indie Hunger Network and for me personally, it's really finding the right data analytics and the people involved at, in R&D with the skill sets helps serve the, to solve the issues that people have in uh, Indianapolis. So we need new approaches to solve inequities and we need diversity in, in innovation to solve those societal issues. So there's still a lot of work to do. And I'll turn that back over to AJ, thank you. Well, thank you, Carl. Uh, excellent case study and what data can do uh, to reach out to the to bridge the equity gaps or inequality gaps. Rather. So with that, we have another expert coming up in data. And Dr. Yi, I appreciate you being there because you're going to talk how good the data could be and what data means in the context of healthcare which is another important parameter at the foundation of the Maslow pyramid. And as, so please go ahead and share your case study. And as she's about to share her slides, I would like to make a comment that where it all started for me is that when I started telling people that these challenges exist in America, not far from where you live. People always believe that they're somewhere overseas in Africa or in Asia or in some parts of South America, and I would like to echo and register this today. We are talking about America and our fellow citizens right here. 
So with that, without further delay, your please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, AJ. Uh, <clears throat> I really want to echo what you said. Uh, given I have worked in uh, in Africa as well as in the U.S. health system, uh, that's uh, well said. Um, thank you for having me, and I would like to start with my um, talk that was my personal story. Um, back in early '90s. I have uh, experience uh, working with a, a factory. Basically at the time, I am really excited of applying artificial intelligence and using neural network uh, in real-time scheduling algorithm and you know, fully on the fully automation uh, process, uh, working on a scheduling problem. And so one of the, the factory actually, you know, is interested in some of the algorithms and um, they do have some sensors and barcode system. And that is uh, one of the things that probably become more of the norm now, uh, the uh, industrial 4.0. I think that's uh, sort, of the, uh, sort of the trend now uh, that's become more of a norm. But back in the 90s, that's uh, still kind of a new things. Um, so at the time um, we have, uh, sort of uh, do a trial. And one of the things we need is uh, the data uh, with the real time data. And so we'll be able to see what is the status of the, uh, at the moment, uh, and the, the, my algorithm be able to tell um, what will be the best strategy to uh, schedule that particular parts. And what happened is uh, we found there's no, no uh, activity in the, in, on, the, on the line. Um, until the end of the day. So what happened is uh, there's nothing coming through until the end of the day. And suddenly there are 400 parts showing up on the data. And so we kind of wonder what's, what's going on because my algorithm basically will not work. Uh, if you don't have real time data, it's not gonna work. Um, so we did a little bit digging and then we realized, you know, people actually don't want to scan the parts as it comes. They want to scan it at the end of the day because to pick up a scanner and scan the individual parts is quite time consuming. So they don't see the point of scanning them until the end of the day. So what happened is all your data show up at the end of the day. Um, so that was a fail. <laughs> so funny story, 15 years later, uh, I walk into the hospital. I saw a nurse with a scanner with multiple pages of barcode uh, printed and or sticker, uh, stick it on the paper. And she was uh, scanning on multiple pages of barcodes. And I was asking her, what is she working on? And because she was trying to concentrating on the computer system and then try to scan the barcode. Um, it turns out she was spending time on scanning the barcode that's supposed to be on the patient's wristband. That's what you see here. So the barcode is supposed to identify the, the patient and also the medication that is given to the patient. However, at the time, because the computer system was on wheel, they called it how computer on wheels, was a little bit too big that she couldn't wheel that into the patient bed next to the patient and the, the scanner was just a little bit too sure that she can't reach the patient. So she couldn't achieve that in the patient room. So it turns out she was sitting at the desk and tried to scan that to finish that at the end of the day. So just to share those two stories to see how the data actually entered to the system and that eventually come through our uh, data set and that's uh, what we see uh, eventually. And of course, some of you may argue that's a data quality issue. Uh, some, of, some of you may say, well, that would just need a better training uh, as people do better. Um, let's hold that thought and, and, and maybe explore a little bit more. So my background, um, as I mentioned, I actually started with a manufacturing background and I have switched to um, healthcare in 2004. And I have an opportunity to work in um, some of the health system in Africa. 
and um, including Kenya, Uganda, Malawi, and I also have some of the experience working with uh, healthcare system in US. Uh, I just list some of the, the projects I have done uh, here. And as you can see, it's very broad. I work with pediatric, I work with uh, um, elder adults uh, type of project. I also work with a community, work on uh, some of disparity issue. And some of the last two I want to, you pay, pay attention to, let list the last two, is more on the policy part of it. I actually look at the policy that Indiana has um, and look at how the policy actually affect people. Um, and some of this is affecting the stroke patient and how we take care of the stroke patient if they do have bypass hospital protocol, if they really pass that rule, and what will in, impact the rural um, residents. And if and if the other one is uh, something to do with uh, uh, they have changed the, 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 the rules to regulate how uh, some of the prescribing uh, rules in uh, Indiana and how that impact uh, the outcome. So I'm kind of looking at this from the system point of view and I want to share with you with my experience, um, people are very excited about data um, in healthcare because there's so much, there's just so much data there. We have claim data, we have patient data. Uh, you are talking about hundreds and thousands of different data field that you can dig your hands in and then apply all kinds of tools that you can ever think of. Um, imaging data um, and laboratory data, basically everything you can imagine is there. Um, so here I wanted to just kind of step back a little bit. At the end of the day, we wanted to improve care. We want to improve quality of care. We want to improve safety. We want to improve access to care. This is actually something I really wanted to emphasize because there's still a lot of people don't have equal access to care. And also the equity part of it is actually, do we actually provide good care for everyone, regardless their race, their education background, their income level, uh, do we actually provide good care to all of them? So here I want to kind of ask a question, what are we consider evidence? Because data, it is something we consider um, objective most of the time. And how much, how, how objective it is. So this is a part I want to sort of walk you through about the human factor part of it in entire chain of data, uh, including how we design initially, how the data was designed to be collected and actually initially the intent, why the data being collected. And this is an example of health data, for example. Uh, health data initially was for patient care. Doctor just jot down notes to make sure they remember what they have done in the in the encounter with the patient initially. Eventually evolved to billing, right? So this is actually evolved into billing the insurance and uh, you know really need a record to understand exactly what kind of billing need to be done or can be paid, and also evolved to liability. So the lawsuit issue, so they need also a good record to prove what has been done when it's not done. So their intent of what kind of record being being recorded, it's really, you see this list, there's nothing to do with for data science to analyze for better care or better treatment because it was not really collected for that. So we just need to understand um, when we analyze the data, it wasn't collected for that purpose, it's really collected for other purpose. Now, so given that context, all the design of data collection and who is collecting the data is all done by humans. So in the way, we also need to understand how that also create bias. Um, because every time we design something, there is a system of process. We all can think of is how that person uh, will imagine how things will be done. Uh, so mostly we will think about the norm, the majority. Now, whenever there is people don't fit in that majority, it will consider they break the system, meaning they don't fit into whatever the framework that we designed. And quite often it become a challenge in the data collection process. 
meaning they may not fit into the field that we designed it for, uh, or they don't come in the right time and place when we need to collect the data. So this also affect the quality of the data we collect, and they may also compromise the quality of data for a particular vulnerable group because they don't fit into the norm that we will anticipate. Now, I want to come down to the last two about data processing analysis, because this is a part most of us are doing as a, uh, an engineering scientist, that we get a set of data, we get excited, and the first thing we do is we clean the data. We want to make sure the data quality is good, they are consistent, we want to make sure they actually combine a different data set, they actually can talk to each other, they actually make sense. So the first thing we do is clean the data, make sure they are taking out all the things that incomplete, the things they actually are matching. So in that process, we actually introduce some of the biases already. And I just want to take that as sort of my own lesson learned um, what happened there. And also small uh, sample size quite often got ignored in the sense that statistically is not going to be significant and they either being seen as an outlier or they just become part of the error. So this is just one uh, recent case I, I, I'm working on. It's a pneumonia case that I'm pulling more than 1.3 million cases out of the data set. And you know, by the time I look at all the criteria I need, it went down to less than 3% of the data actually satisfy all the criteria I need. Now, yes, I, I need all the data set uh, that satisfy the criteria, but as you can see, there's a, some comparison here. Uh, the ratio group representation, it starts to change a little bit. Um, so in the original data set, as you see on the right, cor uh, right uh, column, you see that the percentage representation start to change if I narrow down to what I need. And as a, as a, a data scientist, you, when you want certain things, you kind of start to say, well, this is incomplete data set, so I'm going to exclude this. Uh, this data didn't have that information, so I'm going to take that out. So by the time you do all that, you're actually selective about what you're looking at. And I just want to point that out. I don't have all the solution yet, but I just want to point that out that quite often we're doing this data cleaning, but already we are being very selective. Um, and and we'll change the shape of the data set um, implicitly, uh, even without knowing. Now, this is another part about health data. We have quite a bit of people that are in uninsured. And a lot of them also don't interact with health system. That means they don't even come to the hospital. They don't come to see a provider. So that means we never have a data about them. And that doesn't mean they didn't get sick. That doesn't mean they don't need help. It just means we have no sensor at all about their health condition. And we have no data. And this is another thing we have to be uh, aware that when we do data analysis, what is in the data is only a, a biased data set uh, which people actually have opportunity to interact with the health system. So this is sort of a broad system view and I kind of touched some of the things I already talked about, provider on the right side, patient on the left side, there are some you know, personal bias, liability. There's a lot of things that influence how the data will come together to put into the data warehouse on the bottom. But I want to pay it, want to draw your attention to a few things. The data warehouse on the bottom left, actually, when we did analysis, there will be some selection analysis bias as well, because we use some tools and we use the AI to do analysis, but before we do that, we already did some you know, filtering, we do selection, we do inclusion, exclusion criteria. So that's already do a subset. Now, after that, when we did that, we already exclude some of the population. And of course there are people who didn't even enter the data. So they are not even included. Now, based on that, we will come to risk factor, which is on the red box, and that risk, that risk factor will inform insurance payment structure, meaning what kind of treatment will be paid, will be reimbursed. 
and also will inform on the right lower corner the preventive care guideline, meaning what kind of preventive care should be done and will be paid for, will be reimbursed. And then on the left side, it will give you sort of guideline for what is the best practice, also how the physician will be uh, treating a particular disease. Now, imagine there will be a group of patients that never enter the data into the system, or they are the minority that is not being analyzed or being treated as error. That is not going to be represented in this risk factor. And that means they all the system is not going to consider them as one of the um, beneficiary in a sense. So systematically, we already create a system that basically don't consider them uh, as um, they will benefit from this, this particular whole system. So you will see this is how the disparity is going to get worse and worse because their health condition probably will get worse because the system is not really supporting them. So this is where I see um, as a sort of a data person, uh, do no harm actually is a big calling. Uh, I'm not even sure I can do it because it is require a lot uh, to be responsible about knowing and do due diligence about knowing, you know, what kind of data, what does that mean, where it come from, how do we even answer some of the question, and when we draw a conclusion, how do we draw a conclusion carefully and be careful what we said, how do we uh, set it in a way that uh, people don't misinterpret it. So with that, I will give my time back to uh, AJ. Well, thank you again. Uh, and this has been on the journey, going from where we are, so co then going to Joe in terms of the rich model that he has built based on his years of experience in public and private both. Then Tahir speaking to that, that how it comes to now the design and the engine solutions and the, the technology gaps to excellent examples what in the New York and other places in the classroom then. Then Card, you spoke about how data science can be used for reaching out to really the people those are in need of food and in fact eliminate some of the perceptions as well. And then you were you spoke about how data need to be uh, handled with uh, precision and care, if I may summarize that in, this, in a probably much a naive way, if I may say. So with that, there are quite many questions in the in the chat box, obviously. And what I would like to do is some of those questions, those are critical. So Pallavi, you make an excellent point about accessibility of innovations and wholeheartedly, I can speak, we talked about that before many times uh, among panelists and otherwise, technology is at just the tip uh, of excellence is not enough. Accessibility is very critical, in fact, for bridging those gaps. So thank you for that question. At the same time, uh, Professor Gore asked a question about entrepreneurship. Uh, today, entrepreneurship is one of the means, in fact, translation of science to apply science to the purpose of the society, and that's what we, the theme of this. So is entrepreneurship is a mean to that end goal? Absolutely. It is a part and responsibility for engineers as well. I do not know how you separate two things apart. And Purdue is one of the places that is recognized nationwide for multiple spin-off companies and tech transfers successfully. So absolutely, by all means. And I know, Tahir, you are smiling. So I know wholeheartedly we all agree to that point of translation and impact. So there are other questions for, uh, on complementing presentations and some highlighted. Julius highlighted drones are already delivering blood in Rwanda. And again, we had think about all that, how we can use this technology so people have access and they get access. There are, access is a two plus side. They have access to use them and we provide and train them to get the needs to them through those technologies. Mm -hmm. 
there was a class. Thank you, Tahira, for responding about the ME597 class. Uh, the answers are there. And then, uh, Dr. Mukherjee, you asked a question, can equity be improved by working with cutting edge technologies or those technologies need to think about equity innovation altogether from bottom up? So this is an excellent question to make engage panel panel and I would love to hear. So question is, can equity be improved by working with cutting edge technologies or those technologies need to think about equity innovation altogether from bottom up. So as Professor Raman said, rethinking. So this is an excellent question. So let us go through that point of rethinking. Any colleague would like to speak to that? Well, maybe I can jump on first and then people can add. Uh, as I Please. talk about it earlier, um, definitely technology could uh, assist in identifying the uh, equity issue or disparity, um, but that also has a fundamental issue of accessibility. Um, if the, you know, the fundamental issue is that people don't have access uh, to start with and, and solely um, imagine. So this is where it, it come into people are thinking from their own perspective. Um, so if the design is not really put in the context of how, what people really need and how would that fit in to support what their daily life uh, and simply just thinking from the technology point of view, sometimes that could do more harm than help in my opinion. Over. Well, thank you. If anybody would like to comment on that, I would add a comment maybe that it is really about the problem. It is not about the solution. We have been trained quite a bit to come up with the solution. We get graded. One thing I admit to my class is that I really wish I can grade you for the problems you ask and not about the solutions. So we are very programmed from a very younger age to how to come up with the solution. So it is not about the solution, it is about the problems. So that's where I would I would I would probably keep an open-ended answer maybe in, in many ways. So one of our students asked the question, can we use data-driven analysis to develop an engineering solution for distributing slash decreasing food insecurity in the region? Is it necessary to create a novel engineering solution for delivering food to the insecure households? or can we develop a mobile food bank? So Carl, this might be in your wheelhouse and an experience that you could share a mobile food bank or solutions yeah. like those. What do you think about it? Yeah, that's a, that's a very big question with multiple parts. So that's a good question. But yeah, I think so actually because of COVID, those things are happening already. And so there are mobile food banks going out. I know Gleaner's Food Bank is in Indianapolis and they're very big and they cover a wide range of counties, not just Indianapolis. And they are, that's exactly what they did because of COVID. And they've started to do some mobile deliveries because transportation for those in need is always an issue, which is why we looked at that uh, model of the Indico bus routes. So that's, that's been a, an issue before. And I think because of COVID, actually a lot of the partners in the Indy Hunger Network have really started to think about how can we be more resilient to sort of answer another question at the same time, how can we be more resilient now? And so because of, at the beginning of COVID, everyone was all hands on deck, right? It was an emergency. They were predicting, oh, there could be double the need, which there probably was, and how are we going to get double the food? Our warehouses are full, our pantries are, are as full with the volunteers as much as we can. How are we going to double things? And they tried to do that and they did that. And the National Guard came in and they had big programs and convention centers and things. And so they, they sort of learned under fire, I think, because of COVID. And so the next step post COVID is how do they stay resilient for the next big thing that happens, whether it's another uh, pandemic or something else. And so I think they've learned to be more resilient. And the other thing to think about is that there, there are networks of food banks in the US. There is a large network, so they do communicate. And I'm not sure how much uh, analytical thinking they really do. And so that might be something that to, to pursue in the future. 
sort of what, like a, what I've done here on a micro scale with the Indie Hunger Network. But no, I have not looked at that and, and not known what that overall system looks like. But I think that they, they do talk and communicate, which is the first step. Right? <coughs> at least have that network of communication as most of the presenters have talked about too, the soft skills there before you can think about the quantitative modeling. But in the, and like I said, a lot of the large food banks with gleaners as, a, as an example really do cover a large area. So pretty much they're trying to optimize, you know, central Indiana. There's probably only four or five food banks in Indiana. And then they have associated food pantries that they supply. And so I know in Lafayette, you might have a food bank that covers many of the counties around, around Lafayette and West Lafayette. So I hope that answers the question. But yeah, that sounds like that's a great idea. So, so thank you, Carl. And again, at this point in time, I will encourage people to post their questions. The uh, Professor Aganafer highlighted that the Grand Challenge Scholars Program, GCSP, was created by the National Academy of Engineering to prepare students to help solve some of the largest challenges facing society. And he asked the question that, and there is a description you can read, but can this program be integrated in engineering science courses with potential to address global challenges? So Tahir, to the class that you are teaching and this summer, uh, I experimented with a class uh, in the similar areas. So can a program like this, where engineers are made aware about the grand challenges in the nation and across the nation? I would love to hear your perspective because this is something important as an education leader here at Purdue. So. Sure, um, certainly it can be, but the question is, we all know that when we teach our courses, we already kind of have things mapped out. We have our curriculum all figured out. It, it would require effort um, and intentionality from the instructor. And let's be honest, once, once we have our notes that work, we just like to use them again and again. Um, I've done it. And so that's, that's what will be the challenge is you, we can do anything. And then there's often discussion about, well, there's no room to fit yet one more thing. But the real answer is it can be done. It's just a matter of, is there, can there be time? Can, can the instructor have the time or make the time to do that, um, I think it can be done. So, and AJ, if I could perhaps oh. just build on on uh, to hear his comments, please, please. I think there's a tremendous opportunity. I think to continue in that direction. You know, one of the things that we've begun to work on here at Purdue in the College of Engineering is a minor focused in innovation and transformational change, which is really driven toward this notion of addressing some of these complex grand challenges. And I think uh, to Tahira's point, it's very difficult to incorporate this content into existing courses. We're always struggling in the 15, 16 week timeframe, but we have a, a large set of electives often that are associated with different engineering curricula. And if woven together effectively from an early point in the curriculum, there's a chance for students to come away with a pretty complete view. Um, the minor that we have, for example, is actually 18 credits. So it's a pretty extensive minor and it, you know, it involves six courses. And students really need to start that in their sophomore year, first semester in order to complete that exercise. But if they can, they'll get perspectives from anthropology and sociology, entrepreneurial views, economics, engineering, and, uh, and design. And they could bring all of that together to shape their perspective on the way they could address problems in the future. But I think it's a challenge for, for academia to try and find ways to bring those multiple perspectives into our curriculum. If I could just so, add thank you, more. Drew. Yeah, if I could just add a follow up to that as well. Um, just a, a general comment about the grand challenges. So yeah, there's 14 of them and I know USAID has some grand challenges. What I think is still missing is maybe some challenges that are still very important but maybe they don't have, they don't fit perfectly into the grand challenge areas. Um, you know, I, I mean, I like to think about very practical problems and how do we, for example, you know, the problem with poverty in the United States, and I know AJ, you already think about that in different ways, but what if there were some other types of challenges that are like your day-to-day, -day, like you can walk and see that, like, you know, single mothers that can't go to school because they don't have childcare. 
And it sounds very social, right? Well, the, that let social workers take care of that. Or, I mean, just there's so many other ones that don't fit perfectly into these classic grand challenge areas. It's, it's to the point now, grand challenges are almost becoming cliche. But what about some of just that, just your local neighborhood, or maybe not your local neighborhood, drive somewhere and go to someone else's neighborhood and look at what are some of the issues people are dealing with that engineers can yet get their minds engaged in. Um, you know, this topic of, it's a hot topic, the whole policing and, and how can we impact that? That doesn't, I don't, I mean, I'd have to check where, which grand challenge that might fall under, but it's still an important problem that, you know, people are concerned about. So, so how do we, how do we make opportunities there as well? And, that, and then it gets, it gets challenging when you start getting into those spaces as well. Um, I think most people don't like to touch hot topics or political topics, um, but sometimes you might need to. I think engineers, we have the mind to think about anything, so. Uh, may I just uh, make a comment? Actually, they're, oh, uh, they're already student taking some of those initiatives, uh, just so you know. Um, for example, for security, I know there's a group of students actually take that initiative uh, look at the food security issue at Purdue. Um, so, you know, the, some of those issues you mentioned, uh, it, you know, they are people are really uh, passionate about it and they will make, you know, take action and, um, you know, gather uh, the group of people that really want to do something about it and, and they make the move. So I think it's not, nothing is too small. And um, in my opinion, it's, it's just a matter of, uh, you know, if you're interested in, in taking an initiative and work on something, uh, you can always, uh, you know, get a, a small working group together. Uh, and there's always students looking for this kind of topic. They want to help. Um, and, and I can tell you that their students already have those interest group working to, on those topics. Well, okay. thank you for highlighting there. I know also at Purdue, we have a very large global footprint. It is almost a little United Nation of students here that we have representation from pretty much every country. So that is a very rich environment for that. Also, I would like to acknowledge that one of our attendees is from the Makarere University all the way in Uganda and it is a midnight. So Julius, we appreciate your participation. That just makes me very excited about what we do as educators, so thank you for joining us. And at the same time, I would like to acknowledge that where we are in Indiana, what people call we are in flyover states. So it is about that certain wealth goes from the East Coast to West Coast and we are left. So it is very important for all America. So Tahir, I'm glad you mentioned about political angle as well. It is not a red or a blue issue. It is a red, white, and blue issue. And I just want to echo that. Also, we are focusing today on food insecurity. But if you look at the five parameters, and I would like to register that because this, the dialogue is just initiating. We have insecurity of food. We have insecurity of housing. We have insecurity of clean water and air. Mm -hmm. We have insecurity of access to education. During COVID-19, thousands and thousands and thousands of students because of lack of internet had access challenge to the education, fundamental needs. And the last, which is at foremost right now, that we have inequity gaps in access to COVID-19 vaccine. So again, we really need to think ourselves that what we are inventing and what we are discovering and what we are innovating, does it matter? Because if it does matter, we have great opportunity to help our fellow citizens. We still have six minutes left, so I would like to actually ask an important question to engage all my colleagues. There's a difference between frugal engineering and frugal engineering that can be performed. So I would love to hear everybody's viewpoint because we are by profession, scientists, engineer, entrepreneurs, but what is frugal engineering? And do you see frugal engineering as an avenue to access, to provide access to the highest technology that the brightest mind invent? and then make them accessible and applicable to the parts of the population and the society 
who could be brought along and pull many out, out of poverty or provide them access to these five things that I mentioned. So how do you see the role of frugal engineering in the context? I know it is a big question. We have a limited time, but I would love to invite some thoughts. I think um, I'll start. So frugal engineering, I think what's good about it is, is that it challenges thinkers to really concentrate on sort of like what is the most, the most viable solution, low cost, um, easy to implement, which is always the goal of engineer, right? Cheaper, better, faster. Um, it could be very challenging because to find an elegant solution can be very difficult. Um, and simple solution, very difficult. And so if we can educate and train our students on how to think about frugal engineering applications, um, I would think that the implementation and the the quick, how quickly it can get out or be deployed um, would be increased as opposed to more expensive, clunky solutions that you often see, you know, large budgets to, to create something. It might be easier to do that, but something that is, you know, economical, that might be difficult. And it is, but it's valuable to learn. Thank you, Tahir. Uh, anybody else would like to speak to that? Because sometimes funding agencies may not want to fund the frugal side of the innovation. It has to be a hypersonic or it has to be artificial intelligence. And I would like to have something that I can go to Marion County in Indiana and really help my fellow citizens. Yeah. Is, I, it, is, it, a, is it a contradiction or is it a synergy in some ways? Well, I can jump in next. Uh, I think AJ, uh, I will follow what you said earlier, <laughs> get back to you on it really depending on the problem. And I think sometimes uh, that could be a good option, but sometimes that actually in long term may cost more money and not really address the problem. So I think it really depending on what is really needed. And sometimes it really take a, a big investment to make fundamental change. Uh, and that actually in long term will be better off. Um, and but sometimes it could be a simple solution. And sometimes the solution is about what people can adapt to, um, what people can accept. Uh, as what uh, Tehera was saying earlier, right? You could have a very nice solution, but nobody's ready for it. Uh, that may not be something could actually help. So. I think it's what is it's what people are ready to accept. Sometimes that could be also important, but maybe there's something completely new that nobody know what it is, but have heavy investment, but that really completely changed how people think, how people live. Um, and that might be in long term is a, it's a better way to make that change also. So it really depends. Uh, I, I can see Joe how you want to say something there. <laughs> Joe, you have a couple of minutes and I know you have years of experience in this. So at least few comments are most welcome. Thank you. Yeah, certainly. No, I could definitely build on both what Tahira and, and Yuan said. I think the uh, frugal innovation is a path, uh, one of the exciting paths, I think, to addressing some of these challenges. But the innovation itself needs to be coupled with more of a systemic view of the problem so that we can drive adoption, make it economically sustainable, get leadership to buy into the ideas. And I think, you know, even taking a look at the recent innovations that have affected the COVID pandemic really highlights this issue. We had two extreme innovations, uh, you know, at two different ends of the spectrum really be very influential here. One is vaccines and the other is the mask as you highlighted earlier, AJ. And in both cases, there are issues around access. There's issues around knowledge and awareness and concerns about the effectiveness of these solutions. There's tremendous issues around leadership engagement and, uh, and support for the initiatives and what that does to the community's desire to adopt. And then there are challenges of sustainability and achieving reach at scale. And so, if you will, the same factors come up over and over again in these issues, but they are things that we can consciously think about designing for uh, be it through a frugal mechanism, which has perhaps enhanced potential for sustainability, or by leveraging more advanced approaches that might be useful in certain contexts. 
Thank you, Joe. Uh, and I will write at five. So, Carl, uh, you uh, are a distinguished guest. So make a quick comment if you want. I was just going to say, from an industrial perspective, I think of frugal engineering or innovation a little bit differently, probably because I'm biased from my uh, engineering background in sort of decision making and problem solving, but now applying that more to continuous improvement, operational excellence with respect to research and development. And in industry, we're sort of going to where can we get innovations for free, right? Where can we get frugal innovations that don't cost much? So go do some research, don't spend a lot of time or money and find some new products for us. And so when we're looking at industrial research, especially in, in discovery-based research like agriculture and, and seeds and traits that we do, um, that's really where I think of innovation in sort of process development, innovation in how we think about getting new innovations and new products to market. We're a lot like pharmaceuticals, like vaccines. And we don't have the resources to get a new product out in one year, like the vaccines were recently, but typically that's what, eight to 10 years to get a new product. So how can we innovate and do that in half the time? And that's, that's more productive, more efficient, and that's frugal engineering with respect to new product development. And I'll stop there. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carl. And we are one minute over, and I'm going to first take time so to thank Tahira, you, you and you, Carl, Joe, and Arvind yourself. And one important person I would like to recognize is Stephanie. Stephanie McKinley has done all the great logistical and advisement planning behind the scenes. So a big hand to Stephanie as well in the process and many people those who have invested their mind in making ER2C series successful. Please keep in mind that going forward, this is just taking off the ground uh, first webinar. There will be series of activities in the future as well. But as I said, my life achieved goal is that when I tell people I work in the technology, they don't raise eyebrows. They look at me that I'm accessible and not inaccessible. And that is something we can do by frugally. Please recall that frugal engineers have won Nobel Prizes of the world. So with that, I would like to thank you all for your compassion with the hearts of servant leadership and with the interest in innovation that how we can help our fellow citizens for food, shelter, water, energy, medicine, and education. With that, thank you again. Have a safe and great evening and the rest of the week. Thank you all.